Good afternoon. I'm Abe. And I'm Frank. And today, we're adumbrating Unit 3C in Meyer's AP for Psychology textbook, Genetics, Evolutionary Psychology, and Behavior. All right. I'm sure you guys are really excited, so we're going to start right off. All right. So here we have a diagram of the basic building blocks of who we are. The first thing that we have there is a cell, and then the circular structure in the middle is called a nucleus. The nucleus contains DNA, which uh, is for the most amount of time is structured into a chromosome. Inside the DNA, there are things called genes, which are uh, genetic instructions for how to build who you are. It's genes that dictate what color your hair is, how tall you are, and even how smart you are. So it's that that we're going to be focusing on in the first section of 3C, when we really look at what makes us who we are. So behavioral genetics are the study of the power and the limits of genetic and environmental behavior uh, influences on behavior. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about DNA. How much does it really affect who we are? And this comes back to the nature versus nurture argument. Which one affects who we are more? Uh, nature or genetics or nurture? How we grow up, the environment in which we grow up. Environment for the purposes of AP Psychology is defined as every non-genetic influence. So things that aren't in your genes, aren't in your DNA. As I already explained, for the most time, DNA is coiled up into chromosomes, and DNA itself stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, essentially a combination of different base pairs and different chemicals that make up who you are. And smaller sections of these are called genes. Genes are specific codes for different things inside your body. And the entire uh, instructions for making up who you are is called your genome. But now let's get to something a bit more exciting. We're going to take a look at Fred and George Weasley, two of my favorite characters in the Harry Potter series. They're an example of identical twins. And over here, these two creepy girls are examples of fraternal twins. Fred and George came from the same egg fertilized by the same sperm, as shown in the diagram to the left. The two creepy girls came from the diagram on the right. Two eggs uh, were fertilized by two different sperm, and although they grew up in the same uh, placenta, the same uh, womb, they've developed from different genetic codes. So the question that psychologists ask themselves when they look at identical and fraternal twins is to what extent do the different DNAs of the twins uh, determine their behavior? And the answer can be found in a couple of case studies, which I'll cite. First, psychologists looked at the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease among identical twins and then fraternal twins. And they found that you were far more likely to have Alzheimer's if your twin had it, whether identical or fraternal. Second, they looked at divorce rate among fraternal and identical twins. And once again, they found that if one fraternal twin was divorced, uh, then the other had a 1.6% times more likely chance of being divorced. And it was even higher if it was an identical twin. If one identical twin was divorced, then the chances that the other identical twin would be divorced was 5.5%. Uh, times higher than the normal. So there clearly is a link between being a twin and having the same behavior, even if you're separated at birth. So this next section will be much more interesting than Frank's last section. I resent that. Well, it's the truth. Hey. So let's start out with heritability. Heritability is the extent to which variation among individuals can be attributed to genes that are different between those individuals. It is important to note that individual differences in height and weight are heritable, but nutritional influences are what explain why today's adults are taller than they were 100 years ago. Huh. So that's not heritability. Now, genes are self-regulating. That's a very important principle. This means that genes respond to specific environments. An example of this is a butterfly that is green in the summer but turns brown in the fall thanks to a genetic switch. And we can see that happen with this uh, brown hair rabbit that can change colors. Camouflage. Exactly. So another important point is that genes and experience interact with each other. If you have one baby who is genetically destined to be more sociable and outgoing than another baby, this social baby will attract more affectionate and stimulating care to itself. Thus, this social baby will grow into a warmer and more outgoing person than the second baby. So it is in this way that genes and the environment work together to shape a person. Nature and nurture are united. Now, there's also a very important field called molecular genetics, which is the study of the structure and the function of genes. 
The goal of mo molecular behavior genetics is to discover some of the many genes that influence traits such as body weight and sexual orientation. And then the other goal is to explore the mechanisms that control gene expression. We can also use molecular genetics to predict the chances that a certain person will develop disorders, such as alcohol dependence. So molecular, molecular genetics is very important to people's health. All right, so now we're going to change it up and put into place some of those uh, motives that Abe was talking about in the last slide. And we can look at that mainly through the evolutionary perspective, which we talked a lot about in the very first unit, but now we're going to touch on in more depth. First, let's take a look at our picture there. We have a screenshot from the latest James Bond movie, Spectre. The name's Bond. James Bond. And after we are done cringing at Abe's terrible British accent, we can see that there are a couple evolutionary things playing out. First of all, as we learned from our psychology textbook, men are more likely to be attracted to women who are more attractive, more beautiful, as can be seen in that photograph. And women, likewise, are more uh, more likely to be attracted to physically stronger men, like such me. as such as James Bond, and not Abe. Oh. Um, <laughs> then that's simply because men who are stronger have a more likely chance of being able to su survive, reproduce, and then father a child. So, from an evolutionary perspective, it's better for the woman that Bond is with to. Get with Bond, because Bond's a, he's a tough guy. He's so not going to die. Frank, are you saying that since I can bench twice as much as you, I'm twice as likely to father a child? Uh, yeah, sure, Abe. You keep telling yourself that. However, before we get any further into evolution, there's a few important notes to make. The first is that evolution isn't always perfect. Things called mutations happen. Mutations are random errors in gene replication that lead to change. So that's how you can first evolve something else entirely. It's how life continues to improve and adapt even to today. So when we look, as we kind of already touched upon, how we, when we look at how evolution impacts human sexuality, as I already explained, uh, people are more likely to get with people based off unconscious motives because they're more likely to be able to survive, father a child, or be the mother to a child, and therefore reproduce. So that's how evolutionary perspective applies to this unit. All right, our final section is about the evolutionary perspective. So evolutionary psychology starts with an effect, then moves back to produce an explanation for that effect. And it is for this reason that some psychologists criticize evolutionary psychology for being narrow-minded. Evolutionary psychology states that people have only one motivation for their actions. That is the desire to survive and pass on genes. Wrecked. Yeah. Anyways, another important point to note, as we've emphasized several times, is that we are the product of nature and nurture. While genes are powerful, they are not omnipotent. In fact, culture can supersede genes, as we will see in this next argument. Overall, individual development is influenced by biology, psychology, and social interactions and culture. So, a biological influence would include genetic, genetic variations, physiology, and hormones. A psychological influence would include the gene-environment interaction we were talking about previously, neurological effects of childhood experiences, and more. And social or cultural influences include values our parents instill in us and cultural norms. So the individual is shaped by a threefold influence. Tridentine. Thank you for watching. Please make sure to like and comment down below if you have any questions. Don't forget to subscribe and visit our website at www.socialsciencesyndicate.com for more help.